uh, welcome to everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here talking to Stephen, uh, uh, particularly because uh, his new book um, is uh, about rationality. Uh, I'm a psychologist, as you just heard, and it's something I've been thinking about a great deal, um, uh, particularly because I'm interested in individual differences in how people think and how people uh, reason and how well they can do that. Um, Stephen, I think um, one way of, of um, kind of splitting up psychology research is that some psychology research is about how the modal person, the modal average person goes about thinking, uh, what, what's happening in their, in, their, in their mind when they're thinking about something. And then the other, the other side is how, indiv how individuals differ from each other. Uh, so that's where things like IQ tests come in and, 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 and so on. So um, I propose that we take rationality uh, and talk about it in, in, from both of those perspectives. So you've got this you know, new book coming out later in the year uh, about rationality. Um, uh, what, what, what does the modal rational person look like, or, or indeed the modal irrational person look like? What are they doing that's making, that's making them rational or irrational? Yes, those are, uh, to use some uh, fancy schmancy words, I, I used to be taught that those would be nomothetic and ideographic approaches in psychology. Namely, your standard member of uh, Homo sapiens, and then the uh, issue that interests a lot of uh, lay people is you know, why, why are we so different from one another? Uh, I, and I have always been in the tradition, the, the, the nomothetic tradition, that is, what is your generic uh, uh, mind uh, in Homo sapiens? How does it work? But, but like you, I'm also interested in why people differ. So I think the, uh, the, the uh, uh, if you had to define rationality, what it is uh, that makes a person rational would be the, the ability to attain goals with the use of knowledge. That's my best characterization where knowledge, I, I would, people would say, well, okay, well, what do you mean by knowledge? And I'd, I'd reach for the standard philosopher's definition of justified true belief. So in, uh, in getting what we want with the use of uh, real knowledge about the world, that is what makes us rational. If someone is <coughs> uh, chasing a hallucination, we say they're irrational. If they you know, run out naked into the freezing uh, cold, we say they're irrational. If they, once we have some generic idea of what would be a um, typical goal for a, a human being, then if they take steps that pursue it, we call them rational. Thinking true thoughts is not enough to be rational. If I crank out the digits of pi, if I um, generate a, a bunch of boring true statements from other true statements, we don't really call that uh, rational. We generally call it rational when someone is using knowledge in pursuit of a goal, which of course leaves open the question of uh, what goal do people pursue and perhaps what, pe what goal ought people to pursue. Do you think there's a way of, um, of, uh, of, of measuring or, or having some kind of, um, uh, well, I, you know, as psychologists, we can study rationality and we, we, we have to try and I, I, we have to come up with, you know, what that goal is. Is there a standard way that we can do that in the lab or, or uh, what, what's the most uh, uh, realistic kind of way that we have of, of actually measuring how rational someone is? Yes, well, uh, as I don't, don't have to tell you, we do have ways of measuring uh, intelligence and, and contrary to a lot of um, popular misconceptions, intelligence does seem to be a coherent um, dimension of individual variation, one that can be pretty reliably uh, measured. Rationality, you would expect to overlap a lot with intelligence. What's the point of being intelligent unless you can deploy it to, to get what you want? Uh, there's no, could not be any selective pressure for just thinking true thoughts for, for, for the sake of thinking true thoughts. It's in order to put them into action to uh, <clears throat> win friends and influence people and not get eaten and have enough to eat and stay warm and, and, and uh, all of those uh, relevant goals. Um, so you'd expect them to correlate. And even though there is not uh, a standardized measure of rationality that has the history or psychometric um, credentials as intelligence, uh, people like uh, Keith Stanovich and others have assembled a lot of the laboratory uh, tasks and challenges that cognitive psychologists like Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky and uh, Peter Wason have deployed over the years. And if you assemble a bunch of those, do people succumb to the gambler's fallacy? Do they, uh, are they good uh, at Bayesian reasoning? That is weighing hypotheses in light of evidence. Do they avoid standard statistical fallacies? Uh, you throw a bunch of items like that together, 
then you do get a measure of rationality that correlates, uh, but not perfectly with intelligence. Some people have really good brain power, but don't put it to use for particularly rational ends. Um, other people may not be Einsteins in terms of solving your equations, but, uh, but, but they, uh, uh, they have a good sense in what follows from what. I think the correlations are in the order of maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.7, as, as I recall. So, uh, and, and Keith Stanovich talks about a rationality quotient. It also correlates with other measures um, cognitive reflection. There is a, a fairly an all too well known uh, uh, set of brain teasers called the cognitive reflection test. Uh, three trick questions that, uh, in general, smarter people are less likely to fall for, but a lot of smart people do fall for them. And the ability to uh, not make the error, I'll just throw out one of them, um, you know, with the risk of contaminating the test by divulging 33% of its items. But by now, if the cat is out of the bags, a lot of people have heard of it. So a ball and a bat cost um, $1.10. The, the uh, bat costs a dollar more than the, than the ball. How much does the, uh, the ball cost? And people say 10 cents. And as soon as you actually stop and do the arithmetic, you realize that can't be right. Um, but uh, people falling for questions like that are uh, uh, sometimes intelligent, but are lower in the say rationality quotient. Also correlates it even verges into personality, or people who are open to um, uh, open to experience, open to disconfirmation, willing to reconsider their ideas. Something that, that kind of blends into personality goes into the component of uh, rationality that probably does not perfectly correlate with intelligence. So that's the um, it's the idea uh, the the bat and the ball example is the idea that people are cognitive misers that they uh, that they they don't want to expend their cognitive effort on 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 something and they jump to the first conclusion. I, I do wonder it's with one that, way of looking, it's one way of looking at it, but another is that they are too susceptible to typically reliable environmental uh, cues. Mm -hmm. These are trick questions, and that they. The, the uh, Shane Frederick who uh, picked the dollar and the dollar 10 because he knows it would be a, uh, a, a seductive trap. Mm. Um, and you know, and in general, the world does not, it does not consist of trick questions. And so we you know, do pretty well, but we get tripped up if we don't stop and think twice. So it's, it's not just saving, it is partly saving effort, but it's also subjecting everything to a little bit of extra scrutiny. Yeah. Well, this is what I was going to, I was going to kind of say is that, it, it, you know, they are trick questions and there aren't, as you say, there aren't trick questions like that in the, in the real world, but there are lots of things where our initial impression is wrong and we need to take a step back and think about it. It is a way of training people to be more rational, uh, simply to say, you know, think about what you were doing in the bat and the ball situation and don't do that. You know, take a step back and think, oh, wait a minute, is my first, is my first answer correct here? Is 10 cents the correct answer? Uh, or, or do I need to, do I need to rethink this and, uh, and, and, and apply more, apply more effort? I guess I'm blending together the two theories here. Well, yes. And indeed there is a, a paper just published by my colleague, Ellen Langer of uh, mindfulness fame and Philip Naiman that uh, suggested even a manipulation, just like having people pay a little bit more attention to their surroundings mm. to actually uh, get out of the cognitive rut and just think about what's in front of them, decreases the rate of fallacies right. in a lot of these standard questions from the cognitive psychology lab. I mean, I, I even think that works for, for uh, intelligence, you know, IQ tests as well. I mean, if you tell people who are doing the Raven's matrices test, which uh, just in case anyone doesn't know is of course the one where there are lots of um, uh, uh, there's a sort of panel of different shapes uh, uh, sometimes they're different colors and you have to find the uh, the pattern that, that uh, the shape that fits into the pattern um, if you just simply tell people that there is a rule uh, then I think uh, there, there, there is some evidence that they will improve their their performance on the test you know what you're looking for here is a rule you're you're trying to you're trying to get a rule it's not just that you're you know you're 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 um, you're just faced with these with these uh, uh, abstract shapes and you have to somehow come up with it. It's that, it's the, you know, the first and the second and the third ones relate together in, in the form of a rule. And if you just know that, if you just have that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that little bit of extra knowledge, then it can help you that little bit of extra scaffolding, I guess. Um, and which brings me to uh, 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 something that Keith Stanovich, who's, you know, you've mentioned, who is the, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the main people who advocates, you know, rationality is separate from intelligence. One of the things he talks about is, um, 
uh, by again drawing analogy to intelligence, he talks about um, crystallized aspects of rationality and fluid aspects, and he talks about crystallized facilitators of rationality, um, which might be something like, uh, I, I've, I'm, I'm using my knowledge because I did a course in rationality. Uh, Steven Pinker taught me a course in rationality at Harvard, uh, and, I'm, I'm, and so I have this kind of these kind of uh, uh, this kind of scaffolding. And he also talks about crystallized inhibitors to rationality as well, like believing in astrology or believing in homeopathy or, 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 or something. Do you think there's, that this distinction is worthwhile, that there's a kind of a, that there's, there's, um, there are these kind of um, structures that we can build up over time that stop us from being uh, um, rational? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you brought up the, um, just the, the mindset that allows people to be successful at fairly arbitrary tasks like Raven's progressive matrices. And I mean, this is, I don't have to explain this to you, but one of the big puzzles in psychometrics was the um, effect named after the late philosopher James Flynn, who just passed away a, a month ago, where he found that IQ scores have been rising for about three points a decade over the, for the, over the 20th century, including in a test like the Raven's matrices, that is the set of geometric shape of uh, configurations that you have to then kind of extrapolate. And the, the real, the, the bizarre thing about the um, Flynn effect was that it, at, at first it appeared as if it was a rise in general intelligence uh, because the Ravens is a good indicator of general intelligence. Uh, again, I'm not telling you, you're, you're one of the experts in this. Sure, area. sure, sure. Well, I mean, the, the... But, um, but it was a puzzle because the, uh, the general component of intelligence is heavily biologically loaded. It's highly heritable. It depends on um, uh, whether your mother uh, had um, various insults and accidents when she was pregnant. It seems very biological, but it doesn't seem like the Flynn effect was biological. It seemed to be environmental. And then I think the paradox was resolved. I don't know if it was Flynn himself or a whole team of, of psychometricians. We found that what was improving the scores on the matrices was exactly the kind of mindset that you just identified. What seems to be improving over the decades, even though presumably biologically we're the same creatures as our great grandparents, we're not, uh, you know, we don't have greater brain power, uh, but we do better at certain tasks that have that analytic mindset where we don't just look at uh, say a shape as wallpaper, it's just pretty decorations, but we kind of parse it into its, uh, its shapes, the number of each shape, their relative configuration, we look for the rule. That mindset, which is inculcated by formal schooling, makes you better at the Ravens, holding brain power constant. Mm. It seems to have risen over the decades. It's not, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of intelligence, but it's not the standard kind of uh, general intelligence. Uh, but it's an example of how just raw brain power is not all there is when it comes to getting the right answer to a question. Then in terms of crystallized versus fluid intelligence and crystallized versus fluid rationality, I, I, I indeed think that is a, a vital distinction. And it, pertain, it, it, it speaks to the, uh, a common remedy for rampant irrationality, which is give, uh, make critical thinking a part of the curriculum. And there are courses on, on critical thinking and they've had mixed results because uh, precisely because there may not be any one such thing as critical thinking. Mm -hmm. There may be a little bit of mindfulness and active open-mindedness, but a lot of rationality is mastering particular tools that work in particular situations. And students aren't so good at transferring from one to another. So if you teach people about the sunk cost fallacy, just because you've already sunk a lot of time or money into something, that is not a good rationale for continuing it. You should look forward to what is the reward uh, compared to what you will uh, spend going forward. Uh, that is a particular tool of rationality that may not make you any better at um, uh, avoiding the gambler's fallacy. If you, if for a random process, if there is a run of say, uh, reds and roulette wheel, it does not mean that black is more likely on the next spin. And just because you know the gambler's fallacy doesn't necessarily mean you'll know the sunk cost fallacy. Right. And so being rational might be mastering a set of these tools, knowing where they apply, as opposed to just one general um, you know, mental muscle. Which brings me quite nicely onto the next thing I was going to mention, which is clearly people can be rational in one circumstance and not in others. So uh, you have people who rigorously apply scientific understanding and scientific principles to, to, to one uh, aspect of life, but not at all to another. I mean, the obvious example, to my mind anyway, would be a scientist who is who is religious and takes on faith 
sort of uh, certain arguments. Um, uh, uh, and it doesn't mean that they're doing science wrong necessarily because they could completely leave that aside. But um, it, it does seem it does seem uh, inconsistent. And then, of course, there are more con consequential inconsistencies where people are very irrational about, for instance, some political things, uh, uh, but 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 not about, you know, say, you know, again, uh, uh, possible possibly scientific matters or uh, uh, economic matters or whatever it is. W what, what's your kind of explanation for why people can be, you know, we, we talk about general intelligence, people are intelligent you know, in, in, in lots of different ways, people who are good at one type of cognitivity tend to be good at them all and, 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 and so on, although it doesn't, clearly that doesn't explain uh, uh, all of intelligence. Do you think there's uh, something similar with rationality or, or you know, wh why is it that people have these gaps mm -hmm. in their rationality and, and they seem and that they seem so conspicuous? Yeah, uh, I think there are several things going on. One of them is the one that we just alluded to that, that in addition to um, general intelligence, in addition to active open-mindedness, cognitive reflectiveness, reflectiveness, mindfulness, there's also the mastery of particular cognitive tools. If you're a good Bayesian thinker, you may not necessarily be good at avoiding logical fallacies, because those are just two tools that we have kind of invented to refine and enhance our innate rationality that may have to be acquired separately. That's why a big chunk of my book on rationality is chapters on what I consider to be the most important tools of rationality, uh, Bayesian thinking, logical and critical, uh, and, and crit logic and critical thinking, um, expected utility theory. So that, that's, that's one. Um, the second is that rationality, since it's in pursuit of a goal, often what we call irrational consists of the rational pursuit of a goal that at least collectively is not so rational. So if you've got a scientist, for example, who's just um, you know, boosting his publication count, his ego, his professional career, uh, the, the nobility of the, his, his ideological faction, he might be really, really good at pursuing that, really, really rational. But of course, for the scientific enterprise as a whole, we want the truth and those don't always coincide. So, uh, and, and likewise in the political arena, uh, what we collectively seek, the goal that we ought to uh, arrange our political institutions to pursue is something like <clears throat> the, the, the greatest good, the, the most prosperity, the lowest crime. Uh, on the other hand, you might have political factions that are at each other's throat, each one engaged in zero sum competition uh, with the other to gain power. And to attain that goal, they may be uh, promulgating all kinds of you know, falsehoods that work to the, that gin up solidarity in their coalition, but may not necessarily be good for the country as a whole. I'm so glad you mentioned the uh, the publication count thing and all that. I mean, my my you know most recent hobby horse is the the replication crisis and how the incentives in science are often towards boosting your publication count, boosting your citation count, boosting your uh, uh, um, number of press releases you've put out in about your research, whatever, rather than a rigorous pursuit of the truth uh, um, or, or, or indeed just, you know, reliable research and, and, and so on. So that's a, a, a clear example of a, a rationality failure there. Um, indeed, one of my former students is kind of uh, a junior assistant professor. is kind of nervous because he, it, he and his generation, more so than my generation, has a real appreciation of uh, statistical power. Mm. Um, the fact that a lot of our studies, and I, you know, I count myself as part of the generation that was slow to catch on to this, really did not have enough uh, statistical power because of the number, sheer number of subjects that we had yeah. that uh, in order to detect an effect if it was there, which means that the, a lot of the effects that we did detect were may have been capitalizing on chance. Yeah. But his lament is by waiting and, and accumulating thousands of subjects as opposed to dozens, the number of publications on his CV is gonna be lower because he doesn't <laughs> yeah. you know, jump to publish and he's, he is. It, it, he pinpointed the structural problem that you just identified as a, uh, a disincentive in his own career. Let me mention one other thing that's relevant to your question, especially when it comes to religious scientists. Hmm. Now, you know, granted, scientists on the whole are less religious than the public at large, um, and some branches of science, like um, biology, uh, are uh, the most irreligious sectors of the population. But there still are uh, some brilliant scientists who are religious. Francis mm -hmm. Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health in the right. United States, something of a scientific hero, hero is a uh, devout Christian. Uh, so what's going on there? Uh, and clearly, these are not people you want to call irrational. <laughs> they really aren't. But the way I, I deal with it is that I, I think that the, we have 
two different um, spheres of belief, we meaning homo sapiens, meaning human beings. Uh, this is a distinction that the social psychologist Robert Abelson called the distinction between uh, um, well, the proximate beliefs and uh, distal beliefs. And um, Dan Sperber calls the difference between um, reflective and intuitive beliefs. When someone believes something, there's actually two very different cognitive states. One of them pertains to our everyday world. Uh, is there food in the fridge? Uh, what, will I get the kids to school? Um, if I have a headache, what should I take in order to, uh, to, to alleviate it? Uh, you know, what, what, what am I likely to, to trip over or bump into? There are beliefs are, are reasonably well calibrated to reality. If they didn't, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd be uh, on the street, we'd, be, we'd lose our jobs, our kids would, would, uh, would go hungry. Then there's a whole other sphere that where um, the, the, the distant past, what happened, uh, how, how did the world begin? The metaphysical spheres, is there, does, does good and bad really exist separate from human customs? Uh, remote corridors of power, what actually goes on behind the walls of the, the Kremlin or the White House or, or Downing Street? Uh, the counterfactual, what would things be like if we had acted differently? Where for most of our experience, there's no way of finding out. Certainly through our evolutionary history, there was no way of knowing uh, how the universe works, how atoms work, how microbes work, what happened thousands of years ago to say nothing of millions or billions of years ago. And they were really in the land of mythology, not the land of factual belief. And there the criterion for belief, I, I think is not conformity with facts, which our contemporary science tells us we can and ought to strive for. But in our evolutionary history, this was a, a futile pursuit. There's no way you could find out what happened uh, a billion years ago. So why should you consider that to be in the world of true or false? It's in the world of, is this an empowering myth? Does it reinforce solidarity? Does it promote the right moral values? And I think there's always a skirmish at the border. What's happened since the enlightenment is that the, what you can call universal realism, that is the uh, conviction that all our beliefs uh, are potentially true or false, that there we may not know it, but we ought to pursue, and we ought to validate them, verify them, false, falsify them. That's what the, the mindset of modern science and enlightenment rationalism is very alien to the intuitive human way of thinking, where, yeah, if whether or not there's, there's beer in the fridge there, facts matter, but, um, uh, what, what, what is the ultimate cause of, of um, uh, suffering in the world? Uh, what was the origin of our, the founding fathers of our civilization? Um, it's, you want a good story uh, and you, there's no way of finding out. So, and, and that's what intuitively we all fall back on in some spheres with a battle as to what the boundary is. That's, um, it's something I've thought about you know, during the pandemic uh, has been that, you know, a lot of people have, you know, believed conspiracy theories, all sorts of different types of conspiracy theory uh, for, for, for many years that didn't really matter. It didn't really matter in the world whether whether they believed that aliens were uh, taken to Roswell and operated on or whatever it is. Uh, and it didn't really matter whether they um, even had irrational beliefs about health, you know, so uh, things like taking vitamins and, you know, buying, buying supplements that are not, that there's no evidence that they work, but, you know, they're just spending a little bit of money. It doesn't really cause that much harm probably. But when it comes to a pandemic, that sort of conspiracy thinking um, uh, really does matter. And, and people who are, you know, I bring up vitamins because there is a whole, if you talk about vitamin D and, and coronavirus on Twitter, you get uh, some interesting responses from people who are a little bit too convinced um, of the magical powers of vitamin D, including unfortunately, a couple of uh, quite prominent politicians in the UK who have been pushing this um, this particular idea, um, but uh, that brings me to um, uh, I wanted to I wanted to talk about the, the pandemic uh, and and people's you know irrationality, uh, um, uh, particularly the irrationality of of people who we would consider to be experts. Um, you've had a whole career, I think, of of questioning the expert wisdom on 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 on, on topics. You know, um, the blank slate questions whether uh, uh, people are taking genetics seriously enough or romanticizing uh, uh, um, you know, uh, pre-industrial societies in, in sort of rational ways. Um, your last um, uh, you know, books on, on progress, 
Best Ranger of the Nature and Enlightenment Now are about questioning the general narrative of, oh, everything's getting worse, uh, the, world's get, the world's becoming darker and worse, all, uh, much worse all the time. Even your book on how to write is questioning uh, some you know, people who have irrational rules about uh, 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 grammar and so on. So um, we've seen a lot of expert failure during the pandemic. And, and actually, some of it, right at the very start of the pandemic, was by people who should be the biggest experts in rationality. And I'm referring to some examples of people who were writing articles in February, March, 2020, about how we're being irrational uh, about COVID. We're being irrational about the spread of the, the disease. Um, uh, and in fact, I read an article in Forbes magazine by a science writer who I hadn't heard of, but uh, he was a science writer who writes quite extensively for them, who said, a bat and a ball together cost $1.10 and went through the whole bat and the ball thing and then said, only X number of people currently have coronavirus. There are uh, 7 billion people in the world. Uh, so yeah, you, you can now see why it's irrational to worry about coronavirus. Uh, and there were some, some several other examples of by, by quite prominent professors who, uh, who, who you know, were using this kind of reasoning, um, saying we've, we've, you know, we've really, we've really, um, uh, we're really overestimating this. You're panicking. Your brain isn't working properly if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, if you're worried about coronavirus. What, what went wrong in, in, in these cases? Why, what, what, what's, um, what, what, what caused people who, not just, not just people who'd been trained in rationality, but they're the people who are doing the training in rationality. They're mentioning the bat and the ball question. You know, why are they being so irrational? Well, the, the ultimate irony is that the third question in the cognitive reflection test, the first one is the bat and the ball. The third one is the uh, weeds in a lily patch double every day. The, after 30 days, the pond is completely covered on what day would be half covered. The answer is the 29th day. Most people say the 15th and 16th day. The meant to expose what someone has called the exponential growth bias, which is that human cognition doesn't appreciate exponential and geometric gro growth, constant uh, doubling, where we have, even when we try to compensate for it, we, we tend to confuse it with slight acceleration. We don't really account for the relentless doubling. And of course, that was the fallacy of the fallacy school. So it's especially ironic that they should bring up of all things the cognitive reflection task, because it was true at the time that a tiny fraction of the country was suffering from COVID. But when you have a contagious disease where each person not only infects someone else, but turns them into an infector, and each of the people they sneeze on turn those people into infectors, you get uh, exponential growth. And the tiny percentage of the population that's afflicted now is no indication of the percentage that will be inflicted, uh, afflicted in, in a month. And yes, I, in the book, in order to spare embarrassment to two people that I uh, greatly respect, I, uh, I, I omit their names, but two people said this is an example of the availability bias. You read about a conspicuous example and you think it's more, far more plentiful than, than it is. Uh, so uh, they basically alluded to one fallacy while committing another. Uh, the availability fallacy, but forgetting about the exponential growth bias. But speaking to your, your general question, of course, uh, experts make mistakes, but obviously so do ignoramuses. And the, the lesson can't be um, any old Joe uh, is equally qualified to speak on any topic. Our, you know, our natural state is ignorance. We don't know anything about anything coming into the world. And so even the people best equipped to answer a question, are they're gonna be fallible, they're gonna make mistakes. And what we ought to, on the, and so how do you reconcile the fact that um, there really is a difference between people who know something and people who just have, have uh, opinions and biases and prejudices? On the other hand, experts can be uh, often are wrong. Uh, they, they, uh, and if you're a good Bayesian reasoner, uh, that is, if you optimally adjust your credence in a hypothesis according to evidence, you ought to weight it to the a priori probability of the hypothesis, which means in general, if someone has earned, um, has shown a track record of being an expert, you ought to give their opinions higher weight than a person who has, has, has no track record, no training, et cetera. But as you note, the experts can be wrong. What's crucial is not so much the particular person. We can't have faith in a, a guru, a maven, an expert, but rather the institution that they're part of. What are the rules of the game that apply to them by which they earn their expertise? Did they do it through raw power 
through uh, squashing those who disagreed with them, through political connections, through uh, parentage, or were they playing a game involving empirical testing, peer review, open criticism? If they kind of earned their prestige by being successful at that game, you know, they, they made predictions, other people made predictions, theirs came out uh, right more often, then they, they've earned some uh, credibility, some credence, some priors, while we still have to uh, remain open to the possibility that they might be mistaken, they've got a little bit more claim, uh, but not because they're brilliant, not because they've got a fancy schmancy title, because they were part of a system that rewarded accuracy. And it's the system ultimately in which we should uh, put our faith, not the person. I'm not sure how much that would have helped us in I think I think clearly that clearly that is 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 a, is a great rule to follow. But I just I've been quite shocked by the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, and you know we had experts in the UK who had had become government science advisors through those you know good systems that you were talking about through being the most prominent uh, scientist in their field and 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 so on, who were one year ago today. Uh, I was I was saying that the wonderful uh, there's a wonderful Twitter account called Year COVID, which uh, shows you what people were saying one year ago uh, today, uh, and it's not pretty in in most cases. Um, one year ago today, the the government's chief science advisor was saying, "Well, we need to uh, uh, essentially allow as many people to be infected as possible and have and, and get to herd immunity." He used he used those terms, um, uh, and and you know this is a this is a guy who's extremely trustworthy in in in, in most respects. He's not a kind of um, you know Donald Trump appointee, completely you know off off the wall type person. He's a he's a, a very highly respected um, uh, scientist, and yet you know uh, him being in that position meant that that mistake that he made was extremely consequential because uh, well you know it, it made it meant that they delayed the uh, the the the, uh, the the full lockdown uh, by x number of days. I think nine days is what people talk about. Um, so I just, yeah, I, I, I think in, in some circumstances, again, it's, it's like in some circumstances, these mistakes are not very consequential, but in others, uh, especially when you have an exponentially increasing virus, as you're, as you're talking about, um, they, they really can be devastating. Yes, and I, I think it is worth it to, um, I didn't know about this Twitter account, but to hold um, experts' feet to the fire and see how well they did at predictions, not to discredit or humiliate them, but to learn. Uh, what are the approaches that, that in fact, uh, do give the best guidance? Given that COVID was a, uh, the, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 uh, was a, a novel and in, in some ways unique pathogen, uh, combining both um, virulence and con contagiousness, they often trade off, uh, but it, this, it managed to find the, the, the magic combination of both. It, it kind of, um, there should have been greater preparation, but still it was, a, it was what it was and um, everyone had to kind of cope with it. So mistakes were inevitable. Uh, but now that we have more than a year of experience, it does make sense to go back and see who had the soundest reasoning. Again, not to enshrine some people as heroes and to humiliate others, but to learn how, how we ought to deal with novel uh, challenges to society. One of the, I think, great advances in rationality has been proposed by uh, the psychologist Philip Tetlock in his forecasting tournaments, in which he has, you know, in contrast to standard punditry, where people make uh, either predictions that are soon forgotten or so vague that no one knows whether they're ever right or wrong, um, he has people uh, commit to testable predictions within a particular time frame. How many countries will leave the EU? Will the price of, uh, of crude oil go up or down by a certain amount in a certain time frame? Then to, again, not to uh, so much as to um, reward or humiliate people, but to see what goes into accurate forecasting. And uh, the lessons from that project, which has identified some super forecasters. They tend not to be the, 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 the columnists that you and I have heard of. They tend to be kind of nerds who spend a lot of time on Wikipedia, who know their Bayesian statistics, uh, to know what, what is our most reliable way of dealing with uncertainty, given that none of us is infallible, we're going to make mistakes. How ought we to uh, deal with the challenges that, that face us? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's an amazingly uh, uh, powerful lesson that we've learned is that we need to um, 
yeah, hold, hold people to account. And, and as you say, not not because it's it's uh, it's embarrassing for them, and we should take you know a kind of Schadenfreude enjoyment in that. Although we can in many cases, um, uh, but but because it because it's helpful. Um, so I, I was just going to say at this point that we've got a few uh, questions popping up in the chat. Um, I think uh, if if anyone wants to ask uh, any questions, then type them into the, the Q and A now, and hopefully we will get round to them. I don't know if people are are uh, are are, um, are uh, maybe maybe they didn't notice, but you know if if, if there's any anything you wanted to 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 to, to bring up, I was just going to ask you in the meantime while people think of that. I was going to ask you. You mentioned um, uh, Dan Sperber earlier and his, you know, theory about the um, the uh, distal versus I can't remember the term now. Distal versus ultimate. He, uh, I think he called them intuitive versus reflective beliefs. Right. Uh, Robert Abelson called them um, like the testable versus distal beliefs or proximal right, right. beliefs. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, his his the he has another theory of um, of rationality in the first place, right? And and it's the kind of evolutionary theory. And I thought it was quite nice because you uh, obviously some of your uh, uh, books are focused very strongly on kind of evolutionary theory, and now you're kind of maybe coming back to discussing this from a kind of evolutionary perspective um, in terms of why people are rational in the first place. And you know, we were just talking there about super forecasters, and you know, they're they're continually. Uh, checking their ideas against uh, reality, and there's a whole community of people who are, you know, if you if you go onto the Good Judgment Project website, which is where the super forecasters make their decisions, they post uh, um, they post reasoning, uh, and you get little clips of their reasoning, and so you can kind of learn from 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 them. Um, and of course, the, the 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 scientific peer review system, if it works properly, is a system where people are constantly checking on each other's work. I would argue that in many cases it doesn't work very well um, and is suffused with the sorts of biases and irrationalities that um, we've been we've been talking about. But um, I wondered if you wanted to talk about the uh, the argumentative theory of you know why we are rational in the first place. Yeah, it's an interesting theory proposed by Dan Sterber and Hugo Mercier, uh, and uh, according to which the adaptive function of reasoning, by which they mean explicit step by step. Uh, uh, inference making is to win arguments, not to uh, attain the truth. And it's consistent with something that we see all the time. There are people who just want to win. And uh, a lot of the classic fallacies, um, particularly critical thinking fallacies, the ad hominem argument, argument from authority, um, uh, um, guilt by association, are kind of tricks in order to kind of hoodwink an audience into thinking that you're the expert and that you got it right. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot to that. It, it can only be gone, taken so far. And Andrew Norman, a philosopher at Carnegie Mellon, has written a, a, a critique, noting that we um, can't just use... Uh, reasoning would not have been selected for if it was simply um, sophistry, if it was just a way of bamboozling an audience and had no connection with, uh, with truth. That there has to be some way in which we reason in order to kind of uh, steer a collective understanding to our side indeed, but also to, a, to something that is likely to have some, some claim to the truth. Uh, so this is not to deny the insights uh, behind the argumentative theory, including the fact, uh, a kind of an optimistic takeaway from the theory, which is that this, it sounds kind of cynical. Uh, we're just trying to win you know, pissing contests and boost our ego and reinforce our side. And there is a lot to that, but the optimistic upside is when you put, put people in groups and they have the right rules, their, their challenge is to get the answer right. They kind of do. Um, and a lot of the classic fallacies that you read about in cognitive psychology, the confirmation bias and so on, you put four people together and uh, the one who avoids the fallacy usually convinces the other people in the group and the group is smarter than any of the individual members. It's uh, um, it, it's yeah. I, I I I recommend if people are interested in this, they read the um, original article in Behavioral and Brain Sciences because that's a journal where uh, people put forward their theory and then lots of other people come in and argue with it, which I think is a nice meta point about that uh, about that particular uh, uh, theory. And then the original authors come back and and uh, um, and respond. It's kind of almost like a book length. Uh, treatment of that. Now, I, I'm noticing the little number in the corner getting higher and higher uh, of, of questions that we've been asked. And so uh, I wonder if we should start off um, uh, looking into these now. Um, 
Is it rational uh, to vote in an election? That's one of them. Yeah. Is it rational to vote in an election, bearing in mind the extreme low probability of your vote make a difference to the outcome? This is a classic uh, uh, question in, um, in, uh, in, 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 I guess, in rationality and economics and in, in that kind of reasoning. Political science. Yeah. Political science. Yeah. Yeah. What's your, what's your view? Yeah. So there is a, a, sta a pretty standard view in uh, economics of the type that kind of naughty economists love to promote because they delight in the kind of uh, um, uh, hyper-rational, cynical analyses of human motives, the uh, rational actor theory. I, according to this, this uh, argument, it is irrational to vote because, uh, again, whatever, even if the cost is small, you're still taking time out from work and you're standing in line and, uh, and the chance that you'll affect the outcome of the election is uh, you know, infinitesimal. Although, and I actually had a discussion in the book, I took it out because it, it, uh, too many people objected to it. There's an argument from, uh, of all people, Andrew Gelman, who is the um, kind of statistical policeman par excellence, uh, kind of a rationality enforcer. You don't want to mess with, with uh, Andrew, who argued that if you uh, actually multiply, the, if you actually look at all of the elections that have taken place, there actually have been some that have been decided by one vote, not a US presidential election, but, uh, but some uh, local elections. And if you do an expected utility calculation, you multiply the probability that your vote will, will switch the election by the consequences, how much money the government, one government will spend on something as opposed to the rival uh, government, and then how much it might affect you or affect at least, it doesn't have to affect you personally, it could just affect things that you care about because that's part of your own utility. Is the country going in the direction that, that you want? It may not be so irrational. Now, uh, and, and um, uh, Robert Wiblin of um, the uh, 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 10,000 hours, I think, um, uh, replicated the, that argument and added some others arguing that that is not as irrational as the cynical economists have long uh, maintained. Uh, it's, it's a fun argument. I eventually decided to uh, take it out because some of the game theorists I showed it to just weren't buying it. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Well, sorry, um, I've, I've, uh, I forgot to say that that question was from Keith Long. Uh, so thank you, Keith, for that. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to uh, ask a question uh, now that um, uh, I was going I was actually going to come around to, you know, what should people's heuristics be when they're trying to be uh, uh, rational. Someone asks, uh, Krista Christensen asks, do heuristics make us smart or stupid or both? Um, and I was going to ask you what, you know, you've talked about critical thinking classes, teaching people how to how to uh, reflect more and, uh, and, and so on. But what are the heuristics that we should adopt in order to become more rational? Well, the, uh, the heuristics almost by definition are, uh, and I'll give an example, say availability, which is you estimate the probability or frequency of something according to how easily examples come to mind. So you use your brain's search engine as a way of doing probability. Now, of course, the definition of probability, number of occurrences divided by number of opportunities does not necessarily correspond to what your memory coughs up first. So it opens the door to all kinds of errors. Uh, it is rational in the sense that all things being equal, the things you encounter more often in life will leave a stronger memory trace. You work backwards, the more easily I can think of something, the more frequent it is. And often that does give you the right answer. So if someone would ask me what's more common, uh, you know, sparrows or red-breasted nut, nut hatches um, in, my, in, in, in downtown Boston, and if I said sparrows, because I see them all the time and I never rarely see the, the, the nut hatches, and that's not stupid and it's correct, even if I haven't consulted a bird census, which is what rationally I, I ought to do. But of course, whenever something affects recallability that does not correlate with objective frequency, like how often journalistic biases, like uh, flamboyance, like um, uh, 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 newsworthiness, uh, recency, then it's going to set my um, probability estimate way off. And so I'm going to stay out of planes and drive because the plane crashes are covered in the papers and the car crashes aren't, even though I'm much more likely to die in the car crash. Um, so it can lead to irrationalities. So in general, heuristics, if, you, if they're relied on mindlessly, uh, are not a good way to be rational. Often they're the best we can do. But the point of the various tools of rationality that I try to explain in the book, 
such as probability theory, Bayesian reasoning, statistical decision theory, is to circumvent the problems with the biases, which are that there are many circumstances in which they deliver the wrong answer. Here's a related question from Sam Johnson. Um, the brilliance, he says, of better angels. He's trying to trying to uh, get on your good side. Uh, the brilliance of better angels <laughs> was showing how our unchanging human nature can be reconciled with sharp changes in violence as culture and institutions shift the balance between how the angels and the demons manifest. Do you think there are unchanging angels and demons of rationality embedded in human nature, which can be brought out by changes in our institutions? And if so, you know, what do you think those institutional changes uh, might be? Oh, a, 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 a fa fabulous question, the best possible question. Uh, you know, not, not just because of, uh, you know, uh, of the, uh, the, the flattering content, but I, I think my argument is that that's that exactly right. That it is with ration, violence, so with rationality, it is um, uh, you know, simplistic and unfair to say, well, humans are irrational. We evolved on the savannah. We evolved to run away from, from saber-toothed cats. Uh, what do you expect? Um, just as it is unfair to say, well, humans are uh, products of you know, Hobbesian competition. They're always going to kill each other. War is in our genes. There's nothing you can do to make the world more peaceful. And the, the reason in both cases is, is uh, are, are parallel. Namely, there are different uh, components to human nature. In the case of violence, there are uh, motives that tend to make us violent, such as revenge, such as exploitation, such as dominance. There are also parts of human nature that can push back, like self-control, like empathy, like a moral sense, like cognitive problem solving. And likewise with rationality, we do have these heuristics, if you will, these uh, impulses, what Daniel Kahneman calls system one. Um, on the other hand, we do have a, both an ability to think twice, system two, if you will, not that that explains much to call it system two, but we'll call it system two. Um, plus we have the institutions that we have implemented in order to bring out our kind of rational angels, like you know, peer review for all its flaws. And I'm, I'm totally with you that it, there's a lot of room for improvement, but it's probably better than not having any kind of uh, review or feedback channels. Like demand for testability, um, checks and balances in the political sphere, adversarial proceedings in, um, in, in the courtroom, uh, freedom of the press and freedom of speech in journalism and intellectual life. These rules that we implement in order to prevent our less rational angels or demons, if you will, from, from dominating and to kind of bring out whatever rationality we have and have the system as a whole abide by norms and, and follow institutions that make us collectively more rational than any of us as individually. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I agreed there. And, and yeah, I, I, on, the, on the point of peer review, yeah, I completely agree. You know, there are journals out there that don't do any peer review at all and they are a complete wild, wild west of, uh, the most absurd, uh, you know, one example being the uh, the wonderful journal uh, Medical Hypotheses, which is an example of what you would get if there just was no peer review at all, where um, many papers denying that AIDS uh, is caused by HIV and, uh, and 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 so on. In fact, they had to bring in peer review to kind of coral the papers back. Oh, to, uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did now, they, know that. now they now they now they have peer review. Um, so uh, next one I noticed, um, Daniel Pryor has dropped in to say. Uh, is there a conflict? And this is a this is a kind of a, a classic a classic question, but it's a, a a good one to bring up. Is there a conflict between rationality and the greatest good for the greatest number? So potential examples might be utilitarian justifications for religion, patriotism born of believing national myths, uh, being a moral anti-realist but pretending there are objective ethical facts. Um, in other words, is it sometimes rational to be irrational in uh, in, in 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 certain in certain beliefs? And this is one of the um, you know, if I think back to the the new atheism, which uh, um, you know was a was a great uh, was a great um, uh, uh, thing to be involved with, that was that was one of my, when I was an undergrad. That was that was um, the, the the big thing, and one of the justifications people gave for religion was, well, you're 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 saying that you know rationality is the most important thing, but it's that I'm delusional to believe in God or whatever, and yet. People who are religious are happier. People who are religious are nicer, uh, and and so on. And so maybe they're they're being irrational, according to us, is actually rational in some in in, in some way. Yeah, no, a very interesting question, and uh, 
it does touch on a number of the themes. One of them, by the way, being that the reaction to the new atheism is an excellent illustration of the difference between um, the kind of proximal testable beliefs and more distal reflective mythological beliefs that a lot of the attacks on Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Dan Dennett weren't that they were wrong, that they were mistaken, that here's, here are the reasons why God actually does exist. That's not what you heard. It's kind of like, it's just kind of uncouth or, or not done to consider the existence of God a matter of truth or falsity at all. Uh, you're overstepping your bounds. You're not allowed to raise the question, does God exist? It's not uh, the kind of question you're allowed to submit to truth or falsity. It is uh, empowering, it is ennobling, it is spiritual, and it's just in this different realm of mythology. So it's a great illustration. Um, now the question is, uh, and it is also true that rationality always is relative to the goal. Um, and this is, goes back to, to, to David Hume. And it's hard to say that something is rational or irrational in and of itself. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And I suppose one could raise the question, would it be, and this goes, there are a number of schools of, 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 of political philosophy that, uh, that believe this, that there's a kind of a noble lie that even though we elites know that there's no such thing as God and that you know, 10 commandments were just a, you know, a myth, maybe it'd be better if the teeming masses uh, believed in God because then they'd be you know, nicer to each other. Uh, or or I mean, that's caricaturing it, but that's kind of the, the, the essence of the uh, argument. Uh, now there, you, even there you have to balance the, um, the, the goal of uh, having people be altruistic, pro-social with the other goal of if you're too uh, resistant to the most factual belief as a society, if you close down the avenues of determining the truth, will there be cases where those people who are accepting religious dogma won't accept scientific truth when it really matters, like effectiveness of vaccines or, or of antibiotics or, and so on. There's also the actual factual issue of, are believing societies actually better off and happier? There, I think the actual data, if you just um, look at it, the answer is really no. I mean, the best countries on earth to live in, the richest, the happiest, the freest, the most gender, gender egalitarian, the, the safest, the most peaceful, tend to have pretty high rates of, of disbelief, unbelief, like Scandinavia, like the uh, Commonwealth countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the most religious countries are, are hellholes. I mean, that's where you get the, the, the war and the, uh, and the, the uh, ownership of women and uh, the homophobia and, and everything else. And that's even true in a comparison among American states, the ones with the highest rates of obesity and violence and drug addiction and sexually transmitted disease are the ones with the highest levels of religious belief. So even accepting the premises of the question, we might want to see, is there some utilitarian value to beliefs that we might rationally think are, are factually mistaken? The answer is not so clear. That, that's if you're playing that game in the first place. Sure. My, my, my most recent understanding of the literature, although I haven't looked into this for a couple of years, is that the pro-social aspects of religion tend to be directed at in-group only and not necessarily out-group. That's, that's the, one of the conclusions from a kind of a big review that I read recently. And so it's not necessarily that religious people are just you know, nicer to everyone. It's that they may, may be nicer only to their in-group. And talking about groups, there's a question here from Charlie Cooper, who says, you mentioned that the group is typically smarter than any of the individuals within it. And we talked about how groups can kind of hold each other to account and or, you know, other people can hold people uh, to account. Yet, groupthink is a very real kind of fallacy. So um, uh, Charlie's question is, how should groups be constructed to be most rational? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. And it's not in general the case that groups are more rational than individuals, because we all know about extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds uh, and groupthink. Exactly right. Um, and uh, Sperber and Mercier trying to specify what it is, what is the chemistry of a group that, uh, that does lead it to uh, more, more rational, more correct conclusions. Um, and there is a literature going back to the, I think the late 50s, group, group polarization, group dynamics, when, um, you know, what are the, what, what's the optimal group size? What are the, the rules that they abide by? Um, and I think the, as I remember from Sperber and Mercier, the, the, the groups have to have a, a kind of superordinate goal to attaining 
the, um, the most accurate belief. That is, they're given a, a problem and they're supposed to come up with the right answer. Uh, and they know that there is a right answer and they're trying to come up with it. Uh, that may not be as feasible when it comes to politically fraught decisions, some of which there may not be a correct answer because they involve, they involve trade-offs between values. Uh, and there is a, a literature that I'm not on top of on, on what are the political um, group structures that tend to lead toward better uh, collective beliefs, such as if you have, uh, if you draft a citizen's council of randomly selected people from a community and you throw them together to come up with a policy, uh, what <clears throat> makes them come up with a better policy than if you have a bunch of uh, members of parliament shouting back and forth across the aisle? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, conscious of the time, and so I'm looking for a question that might uh, be fairly brief to answer. There's one here from, uh, maybe this isn't a brief question to answer, but I thought it was an interesting one. And um, Kelly Hewell asks, what percentage of misunderstandings would you estimate are at the root semantic? So are not necessarily arguing over a, over a, a, a substantive thing, but are just, are just a, a, a semantic disagreement. And, and, you know, are we kind of being irrational to focus on so many semantic <laughs> disagreements all the time? Interesting question, and I'm, I'm apt to fall back on the availability heuristic, and my mind is now uh, kind of groping for examples. Uh, to, so I, I don't know, and I don't have the right quantification way, <laughs> basis for quantifying them. Uh, probably a lot, in that um, you know, a lot of the times we the terms that are given to us by the English language are too coarse. Um, language is highly polysemous; that is, words have multiple meanings. And uh, so without giving an, an exact figure, which I know will be wrong, whatever, because <laughs> I know how I'm going to come up with it, but I will um, agree with the premise of the question that the answer is a lot, and that if we were more precise with our terms, often some of our, our disagreements might go away. Agreed. And, and a nice way to end it. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, back to Saloni now. Um, but thank you so much, Stephen. That was really uh, uh, great to talk to you. And I wish you all the best with uh, the book Rationality. Thanks so much, Stuart. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks.